Okay, we're gonna look at some more lighting code and maybe start looking at some texture code too. And one of the things we're gonna see, OpenGL is, this style of OpenGL is, is about the ugliest code you can imagine writing. It is not fun to write this kind of code. It's kind of fun to see the results. You get, you get to see graphics, but it really is weird code to write. If there's almost no logic, you, you're, you know, I'll show you in a second like what things look like. Your OpenGL is a state machine and you're mostly just setting parameters in the state machine, turning this on, turning this off, turning this on, turning this off. And you write massive amounts of code where you're just turning on and turning off features in the state. It's weird. You know, there's not, the, the, the OpenGL does all the work. Yeah, so all the work is being done by OpenGL. You're just telling, you're essentially telling OpenGL what to do. And, and it ends up being kind of ugly code. And I'm not sure if the more modern OpenGL might be a little bit nicer, some kind of, I think what we'll do is we'll do one more thing with this, with the old OpenGL, which is textures. So we'll do lighting and textures with old OpenGL. And then, and then we'll turn to the newer OpenGL, which is the shaders and start looking at how, how you write shaders. I have, a, I have a, I, I started to think that maybe it's actually more elegant code or more, at least more interesting to write. The, the shader is kind of a weird language. You're writing on it, you're programming on a GPU, but you're writing the code. You're not manipulating the state machine like before. The OpenGL is much less state and much more code. You know, right now it's all state and no code. And I think then it's gonna become more code and less state. Is that the code's kind of funny. Like you're not gonna program in Java anymore. You can't, you, the, the, the shaders are not written. As far as I know, no one's ever written a Java compiler for the shaders. They, there's no reason why they can't. But as far as I know, no one's got a compiler from Java to shader, the shader assembly language. They're, they're essentially, it's C to shader assembly language. So you're writing in a, a most, you're, you're not writing in C, it's not C either, but the language looks and feels and acts pretty much like C. It was modeled on C. So, hmm? No, 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 just, it's, it's a weird version of C. Yeah, it's really just a weird version of C, okay? And uh, I mean, it's just, it's, a, the, the GPU is a, a CPU, so it runs in assembly language. So anything can be translated into that assembly language. So you could write Python and have it compiled to the GPU, but it doesn't seem like anyone's doing that. Yeah, uh, there don't seem to be compilers for shader programming other than for this, uh, original shader language, which is very much modeled on C. So that's, I, I think that's what we'll turn to after we've done lighting and shader, uh, lighting and textures. We'll, we'll see if we can do a little bit of shader programming. Okay, so I've got a couple more examples in here of lighting. Now, um, there's two places I've been getting examples from. One is this online textbook. This, this textbook here. And the other is the original OpenGL textbook, the very, very, very original OpenGL textbook from, uh, and I put links to it in here. That's this textbook here. Okay. I mean, uh, th this is the table of contents for it. I mean, you can buy the book. Only the very first edition is on publicly available online. It's called the Red Book because it was originally had a red paperback book with a red cover and it's in an eighth or a ninth edition now. And it's still a good book on, on, it, on OpenGL, but they've allowed the very first edition of it to be made publicly available. So the very first edition is in the public domain and that's this. And there's a chapter on lighting and that is the version, you know, that's the same. Now this is Java 1.1. And this book here is also Java 1.1. So they're both talking about the same version of OpenGL. You know, they're both talking about this older version of OpenGL, very first version. So this book here and this book here both do the same version of OpenGL. And this one has code examples in the web page. And I've been copying, see here's like, here's the first example. That's this example we did the other day. This example here is this example over here. So I took this example and this one's pretty simple. Okay, now here's the code 
I mean, there's this is C, and and I mean, actually, here, this is C, and this is what it looks like when you turn it into Java. Remember, Joggle is, for the most part, just a one-to-one -one translation of C into uh, Java functions. So, for example, here's the init function. Here's the init function in C. Now, on the left is in Java. And not much different. In Java, you create an instance of this object, this GL2 object. That's the object that holds all the C functions, the, tr the Java translations of the C functions. So you create an instance of that object. Then you just notice that every function that was called in C just gets called inside that object. See, every C function now sits inside of that object. So gl.gl enable, gl.gl enable, gl.gl light v. So all you do is you stick this object in front of the function calls because all the functions have been essentially put in this object. So first you have to instantiate the object. These are all uh, instance methods in that, you know, they could have been made as static methods or they could have been made as instance methods. They had their choice. They made them instance methods. If there were static methods, you wouldn't make an instance of the object. You would just write capital GL2 here instead of writing GL. Okay, so they made them instance methods in that class. Okay, so you create an instance of this class here that holds all these methods. And then, then it's just, and then any constant, see, these are C constants. Those constants are also in that object. So every constant becomes GL dot. So they become constants in that object. They're fields in the object. So it's more or less a matter of just tacking on this. Now, people almost always call that object GL. You can call it Bob if you want, but then, you know, who wants to write Bob.gl enable? So everybody calls that object GL, and then you type GL.gl, GL.gl. You know, over here, the tradition was to make every function in OpenGL and put a little GL in front of it. And, and people in C did that all the time. Everybody's library, they give their library name a little monomic, and then they put the name, they put like a the, the abbreviation of their library name in front of their function name. So that, that was just, a, that's a readability thing. So when you're reading this, you know which are the open GL functions. They all have names that begin GL something. Okay, so you can see here, these are all open GL function, open GL function, open GL function, open GL function, because they got little GLs. They could have dropped the GLs here, and then you would just write GL dot enable. And I think some people were hope, you know, would have like preferred that naming convention, you know, drop the GLs from here, but then these function names and these function names wouldn't have been the same. So I think they went with the kind of more redundant GL.GL. That way these function names are these function names. Okay. Now look at the code you're writing. There's no logic there. All I'm doing is telling OpenGL, turn on this, turn on this, turn on this, turn on this, turn on this. You know, and OpenGL will do all the work, but I'm saying enable lighting, enable light zero, enable depth testing, okay? Here I'm saying that, here I'm passing parameters to OpenGL. I'm saying, see, there's a matrix, there's a vector up here that holds the specular light, okay? So that's a, oh, notice that GL flow, OpenGL had their own types for everything. I don't know quite why they did that. So you don't say float, you say GL float. What's a GL float? A float. But you know, it, you know, and if, you, if you went over here and you wrote float instead of GL float, it would work. Okay, but they had a tradition of giving, now Microsoft did the same thing. If you, if you ever write Microsoft code for Windows, Microsoft gave names to every data type, their own name to every data type. So they, it's like a, an int in Microsoft's wording becomes a word. Yeah. And, and so, so I, that was something people seem to have done in the 80s and 90s. They, they, for some reason, they gave new names to all the data types. 
So that's an array of float, except that you can call it, there you call it GL float. Now on, on Joggle, luckily, didn't create a GL float data type. Luckily, Joggle didn't do anything that dumb. So you just use a float array. Yeah. So you just hit over in Joggle side, you don't use a GL float array. I don't, I don't, I don't even know if there is one, maybe there is, but I, nobody seems to use it. So I don't know if maybe they didn't create GL float, but you just use float array. Okay. Right. Now there's an array of there's R G B specular color. Okay. So here I have to tell OpenGL that I want to use that array as the specular data for the fronts of every polygon. Now in OpenGL, a polygon's got a front and a back. And just like a lot of things, the front and the back don't have to look alike. So you can make the front look like paper and you can make the back look like gold. You can make the front look like marble and you can make the back look like bronze. So you, you can associate to the front and the back. So you just sit there and you type all this code. You know, the front of this looks like this, the back of this looks like this, the front of this looks like this. So here, the front of our polygon, the specular part of it looks like that. The front of our polygon, the shiniest of them looks like that. Okay, and then the other, we'll do other examples. We'll see that you can set both the, the, like here, I'm not setting the ambient. All I'm setting is specular and shininess. I'm not doing the diffuse and I'm not doing the ambient. Okay, so if I did all specular, diffuse, ambient, front, back, you know, like in a real game, you just sit there and have these long lists of things like GL front this, GL front that, GL specular this. You, know, you just start writing long lists of things where you're just telling OpenGL, that this is the specular part of the fronts. This is the shininess of the fronts. Okay, now here I'm setting the position. So I'm saying light zeros position is there. So I'm calling the light function. And I'm, I'm also doing, I'm not doing logic. I'm passing information to the GPU. The GPU will take all this information and use it. All I'm doing is I'm feeding information to the GPU. I, I write massive amounts of code like this in OpenGL. And, and the, the GPU does most of the computing. It, 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 it does, for example, all the light calculations we looked at the other day, the light calculations, all those formulas, they're built in the GPU. You, know, you don't write the logic for the light. Okay. And this is, this is not much. You know, in, in a minute, we'll see examples where it's just even more of this. Yeah, here I'm using only one light. I'm not bothering to say what the backsides of the, uh, anything is, only one light. I'm only doing specular light, so there's specular and shiny. I'm not doing the diffuse, and I'm not doing the ambient, and I'm not doing the glowing. Okay, all right. So, and then after all this setup, display, there's not much to do. The display just clears the picture, draws a sphere, and that's it. There's no, yeah, and also this is just a picture of a sphere with light shining. Okay, so I, I enable everything, and then the display is just to draw a picture of a sphere. Okay, and uh, then there's a reshape. If you reshape things, it, it'll uh, just re, yeah, the sphere. If in this case, if you reshape it, the sphere will end up being uh, elliptical. So it's not a very smart reshaping. And if I reshape it, oh no, it's, it's, I'm sorry, this one is kind of smart. When I reshape it, it scales it so that it's, it doesn't just go like that. You know, it actually keeps the aspect ratio proper. Yeah, I forgot. So they, the, the, this, I mean, the example in this book does kind of a nicer thing. It keeps it a sphere. So as you do the reshaping, okay, it's kind of nice. As you do the reshaping, it, keep, it keeps it centered on the screen and it makes it always a sphere. So it's, it stays round instead of just getting squashed and things like that. So the, the reshape function is a little bit more clever than just take the, take the screen and, and, and uh, stretch it across the whole window. Okay. So there's my own, actually, there's my little bit of logic. Yeah, there's a little bit of logic that we have to write because OpenGL doesn't know anything about the screen. So if you want OpenGL to draw a sphere and not just spread it across the whole screen, you have to do a little bit of logic to figure out what's the right 
dimensions through the through the uh, screen. Okay. All right. Now, this thing, real simple. There's a. Uh, One specular light, okay? So one light over here, shining that way, that just has shininess light to it. No diffuse, notice that uh, most of the sphere is just kind of invisible to us because there's no diffuse light being used. So since there's no diffuse light, it's only, you, it's only the light that's actually shining from over here. That's, that, that, it's not, you know, it's not like acting like uh, a lamp virgin surface that where you see at least the whole thing. You know, with specular light, you only the part that you know only the light that's really pretty directly hitting it affects it. Okay. So this one, you know, if we we only we pretty like uh, there. If you look back there, you see more of the sphere. Or if you look on here, this thing's really a lousy projector. So it's a pretty cheap projector. You know, here you almost you don't. You, you know, this is just black over here. But you notice you actually can't see all of the sphere. Yeah, you know, there's a little bit of light that's illuminating the whole sphere. And you can see it there and there, but not on this guy. This guy just doesn't have enough con This is just a really, probably a really old projector. Okay. All right. So there's yeah, you know, there is light on the whole sphere, but not very much. But if we that's because we're using specular light. We're not, we're not using the diffuse light in this case. Now, this example, they, they elaborated on it a little bit. So here's the next version of it that, that they elaborated a little bit. Let me show you what it looks like first. Oh, okay. This one adds another light. Okay, now there's two lights, the original one from over here and a spotlight over here. Okay, now to show you what the two lights look like, let's, okay, let's look at the code. We'll turn off one light at a time. Okay, so here's the second one. Okay, now we're starting to get more and more stuff on the screen for one thing, okay? There's gonna be two lights. So I have to configure two lights. So. Here is the first light. It's the same as it was before. Okay, that light is just using specular light. Okay, then here is a second light. Okay, now the light. The first one was light zero. The second one is light one. Okay, this one's going to use ambient. There's all of it: ambient, diffuse, specular. So all three lights. Instead of just specular, now it's a mixture of ambient, diffuse, and specular position and it's a spotlight so the spotlight's got a direction okay it's the different thing there's between a light bulb and a flashlight when you flip on a light bulb light radiates 360 degrees but if you turn on a flashlight light comes out in a beam so OpenGL has two kinds of light the default light's like a light bulb light radiates in all 360 degrees but this one's going to be a spotlight spotlight has a vector attached to it, it says the light's coming in that direction so it's more of a beam of light in a certain direction. So this is the vector that describes the direction the light's pointed in, okay? Notice it's negative one, negative one, because remember the camera looks down the negative Z axis. So positive Z is coming out at you. You're looking down the negative Z axis. For a vector to point towards my, my light here, my vector has to be pointed in the negative direction. So this is pointed in the negative, you know, neg it's actually pointed kind of net down at an angle like that, okay? All right, so uh, ambient diffuse specular RGBs, a position for the light and a direction for the light. Then I have to start turning on stuff. So this is all light one. See, everything's light one. Oh, you're only allowed eight lights. There's only, there's, yeah, the, the number of lights is built into the OpenGL. There are eight lights, light zero through light seven. And I think if you buy, uh, that's what, uh, there's eight lights in the core of OpenGL. If you buy a fancy graphics card, you got more lights, but then they're not part of core OpenGL. 
So if a game used more than the core number of lights, you had to have a graphics card that supported more than the core number of lights. A graphics card was guaranteed to support the minimum that OpenGL required, which was eight lights, but a graphics card could have more than eight lights. Modern OpenGL have any limit on the number of lights. I don't think there's any limit on the number of lights anymore like, like there was in this old OpenGL. Okay, so this is light one. Then I'm saying the ambient for light one is that array. The diffuse for light one is that array. Specular from light one is that array. The positional light one is that array. Then, then here is going to be some more uh, constants that are, this is going to use what's called attenuation. You're allowed to let light dim out as it goes away. Okay. You don't see that with a flashlight, but think about uh, lighthouses out in the ocean. You know, the light eventually just dies out. So OpenGL has this notion that a light, if you wanted to, can just drop out. If like if you're modeling a light beam that's like strike, like if you're in a car on a country road, there's a certain point where your light beam just doesn't shine any farther. There's a limit to how much your light beam. Like in this room, if I went outdoors in the middle of the night, my flashlight would be like that too. There'd be just a limit to how far my flashlight could shine. You wouldn't see it in this room, but you can. So you can set the limit of a light using these constants. These are called attenuation constants. There's a, it's, it's actually set up as a quadratic formula. It's set up as a formula. Notice how OpenGL, you do nothing but set constants. You don't do any programming. A quadratic formula looks like AX squared plus A quadratic formula is ax squared plus bx plus c. Okay. That's the formula for how light attenuates. The c is the constant term, the b is the linear term, and the a is the quadratic term. There's the three terms of a quadratic formula for how the light drops off. The light drops off quadratically. Now, you, know, you never see that formula, it's buried inside the graphics card but you need three lines of code to say on GL light one, set the attenuation constant to this. On GL light one, set the linear constant to this. On GL light one, set the quadratic constant to this. You know, it, it's, this is the style of program. It's just setting parameters all over the place. You know, you're just setting all these parameters. Okay. Then, um, then here's where I tell OpenGL that I want that to be a spotlight. So I'm saying to I'm saying to OpenGL, GL light one is a spotlight, okay? And light one, uh, I don't know what this spot exponent is. It's got part to do with the spot. It's got something to do with the spotlight. I don't know if it has to do with the. Uh, you can have like a really wide beam spotlight or kind of a focused spotlight. One of these has to do with how focused the spotlight is. I don't remember which one it is. This one I commented out doesn't seem to work. If I uncomment that, even though it's in the original code in this book. If I uncomment that, the light disappears. And I don't know why I haven't had time to look up what's going on. Maybe it's a bad parameter. But if I, I will show, I'll show you. But if I uncomment that, the light go, the light it disappears. Okay. Now, then I enable light lighting. Then I enable light zero. Then I enable light one. Okay. So let's let's turn off light zero. Light zero is the one we used before. So turn off light zero. Now notice that it's okay to it's okay to parameterize light zero and then not turn it on. Yeah, it makes sense. You know, depending on the situation, you may have a light that's turned off and on. You know, a character turns the light switch on, the light goes on. So you may have the light all configured in a game, but it's turned off. And at some point it gets turned on. So light zero has been configured, but here I turn it off. Okay. And now that leaves me only with light one. That's the new light. There's the spotlight, okay? That one's the spotlight. Let's see it a little bit better this way. Spotlight shining from the left, okay? Now the spotlight has both diffuse and specular. So you're getting the specular part of it, but 
the spotlight's more focused. So it also doesn't illuminate much of the other side of the sphere because the spotlight is just very much a spotlight. And I, I changed the color of the light from the book. In the book, it's actually just another white light, which means that when you turn on the two lights, you can hardly tell which one's which. So in the code, I actually changed the color of the light. So it's kind of purplish. So I did that up there. The, uh, well, there's a little tiny bit of ambient light. The spotlight has a little bit of ambient light. And I made that white. And then I made the diffuse, it does it's 1.51, 1, and the specular is a half, one, a half. So I, I, I mixed up the colors a little bit. So it turned out to be kind of purplish. Yeah, it ended up being a little bit purplish in the color. Okay. Right. Then, if, then you can turn on, you can turn off that light and turn on the other light. That's just, that's the same as the first program, okay? There's just the, uh, there's the, the, that's the light bulb. That light's a light bulb. It's actually radiating light in all directions, okay? And then you can turn them both on. Okay. So there's a mixture of a white light bulb and a purplish spotlight shining from two different directions. There's the specular effect of the spotlight. That's the specular effect of the, of the light bulb. Okay. Right. The, what's, the, the main thing is just to see what does the code look like? And the code mostly looks like setting lots of parameters. You know, back down here, notice that there's, again, all you do then is just say, clear the screen, draw the sphere, done. Okay. So there's, you know, we're just, we're just lighting a sphere, okay? Okay. Now, the next example, let me just show you what it looks like. Same sphere, same light, different material properties of the sphere. Okay, so now what we're changing, we're now the, each sphere is the same sphere, the same light on the sphere, but each what's changing is what the material of the sphere is. Okay, so this is an example that's supposed to show you how to set the, the material properties of the object, not changing the light. And a minute ago, we were looking at modifying the light source. Now we're gonna have the same light source over and over again. Now, um, okay. How does this one work? Okay, way more, no, way more code. Now here's roughly what you're gonna do. There's an ambient component of there's the ambient component of uh, there's well there's two different ambient components we're going to switch between them there is diffuse there's specular there's the shininess that goes with the specular there's a different shininess component there's a different shininess component so there's three different so along with the specular light we're going to choose three different shininesses of it. Okay, then what they're going to do is set up different spheres using different combinations of those of that data up here. Okay, so what, what we're going to do here is this is going to draw one sphere, then we're going to draw the second sphere, then we're going to draw the third sphere. So we're going to draw the sphere one at a time. Okay, we're doing a push matrix and pop matrix because we're gonna take the sphere, push it onto the side, draw it, then move it, redraw it, then move it, redraw it, then move it, redraw it. Each time we draw it, we change what it looks like. Not its shape, but we change what material it's made out of. The light's gonna stay the same. The shape of the sphere is gonna stay the same. Two things are gonna change. We're gonna move the location of the sphere. Now, since the light's not changing, that means that 
if the light's right here, sometimes the sphere's got the light a little bit to the left of it. Sometimes the, light, the sphere's got the light a little bit to the right of it. So the light's not going to move, but the sphere is going to move. And notice, you know, notice that what we're really doing is just kind of odd. Are there four? There's four spheres in this picture. There's only one sphere in the, in the program. This picture is actually being built in a weird way. You'd think that my scene had four spheres in it. And actually, I'm playing a game. What I'm doing is I'm putting the sphere over here, essentially taking a snapshot, and then moving the sphere over here and re-exposing the film. This is like a photographer who takes a picture and doesn't advance the film, but moves the camera and takes a picture again and re-exposes the film. This is actually a weird trick that you could do in OpenGL. So what I'm doing here is I'm essentially saying the frame buffer is empty. Then I fill one part of it with the picture of a sphere. Then I move the sphere and I re-expose the frame buffer and put some more information in it. Then I move the sphere over here and I re-expose the frame buffer. Then I move the sphere over here and I re-expose the frame buffer. I, know, I don't say, here's four spheres, take a picture of them. I say, here's a sphere, take a picture, don't advance the film yet. Move the sphere, take another picture with the same film. So now you're re-exposing the film. So now two images appear on that film. Now you can do this because you're doing it real fast. Yeah. It doesn't override. Hmm? It will not override. Well, there was nothing. See, the second time you expose it, there's nothing over here. So, so nothing gets rewritten on this part. So only this part of the buffer gets filled. So now if there was something over here, it, you, know, you could end up with a really blurry picture if you don't do this carefully. The key is that this, this sphere moves over to here. So when I re-snap the picture, that part doesn't get touched. So it just stays where it was. Then when I move this sphere over here, if the sphere is over, well, actually, let me do this over again. And I'm going to not move the sphere over very much. Okay. See, here's where I move. So here I move the sphere to the left. The sphere starts out in the center. I move it to the left. Then here I move it. Now, again, the sphere is in. The, now, then I do a pop matrix. So now the sphere is back to the center. That's where it's natural. That's where its model coordinates are. So the sphere is in the center of the coordinate system. Here I did a push matrix, translate, that pushes him way off to the left, draw him, pop, he's back to the center. Then I push matrix, I translate him a little bit. Now, let me translate him like a little bit too much this time. So he overlaps with the one that was drawn before. What happens now? One part of the film is going to be exposed twice. Kind of messed up. You see this like, yeah, you know, it's, it's not at all what you would want. Yeah, you know, what it is is, you know, this part of the sphere, this got exposed once. And that, what, that, this one should have kind of gone like that, but then this guy slid over and it's not even clear like why there's this straight line here. You know, where, why is there that real sharp line there? Let's see. And he's going like this. I'm not sure what's chopping that off. Um, is that like the reflection point? No. I think it's, this thing might be painting a square buffer. And, the, and so you're getting this sharp vertical edge. I'm not really even sure why it's a sharp vertical edge. Really not quite clear. Let me move it a little bit farther over. See if you can get a hint at what's going on. Let me move him a little bit farther over. A little bit farther over would be like five five here. Okay. 
and it's not much difference. I didn't, maybe I didn't move them enough over. So I'm, I, I'm not getting much difference here. There's that, that vertical line just somehow moved over some more. It looks like it's where the edges meet. Yeah, for each it's, it's the intersection of the, the it's intersections of them. It doesn't it know, just does a line. It doesn't center. know what to like because one is curving. They're curving into each other, so they're meeting at a they're meeting at a point. But this one was meeting. okay. Wait a minute. And it's it's represented as just a vertical line no. because we have no depth on it. This one, maybe that's, okay, this one got drawn first. Then this guy's being drawn on top of it. This one's got, you know, this one's not, they're not being drawn at the same time. They're being drawn at two different times. Right. He's drawn first, he's drawn on top of it. Okay, when he's drawn, why don't you see all of the rest of him? Unless he happens to be behind this one. So, oh, he's curving behind he's, him. He's curving inside. Yeah, yeah. so the depth. The surface of. So he's actually behind this one. Yeah. So he curves behind him so he doesn't really actually erase him. Because he's actually he's actually curving behind him. Uh, but then I still want to think that this curve line would be like, it's not a straight, I'm not sure. It's weird that it's the intersection point. I mean, it's at the same heights. That's so weird. Well, is it is it orthographic? Uh, no. Oh, good question. Are we using orthographic? Good point. Yeah, because if we're using orthographic projection, that would change things. Is this one? I think maybe this one is orthographic. That would explain why we get the straight line. Yeah, it is. Yeah, this one's not perspective projection. It's orthographic projection. So that probably does help explain why it's a perfectly straight line. Okay. Now, the thing is we're doing something, you know, this trick of exposing part of the frame buffer, then exposing another part of the frame buffer, then exposing another part of the frame buffer is a weird trick. It's, you know, there aren't four spheres on the screen. There's only one sphere being drawn four times. And sometimes you can get away with this, but yeah, if you, if you don't do it right, if, well, if they kind of overlap, all kinds of bizarre things happen. Because we're really, it's like a photographer, you know, taking a picture, then not advancing the film, then essentially using the same piece of film and re-exposing it, which photographers used to do all the time when they had real film, as a way of creating weird special effects. You, you know, that's how you like get double images. You know, you, you just take a picture. I don't know if you can do, I don't know if digital cameras will let you do that. Does anybody know, can you do that with most digital cameras? Will they let you like re-expose the same picture? It'd be easy for them to do it. They would just, you know, keep the same picture in the frame buffer while you take another picture and just double expose them. You know, I, I don't know if these guys can do that or not. I bet they can, but maybe you need special software to force them to do it. Yeah, say capability-wise, I don't see why they're not. Yeah, because all they'd be doing is saying, leave the old picture in the frame buffer and then just put the new picture on, blur, you know, blend them together. Okay. Cameras did it just by not advancing the film. The photographer would shoot the picture. If they had a, like most cameras advance the film automatically, but some expensive cameras you had to, you had to like crank the cat film and photographers would take a picture, not crank the film and take another picture and get double, what they call double exposures. This is a double exposure. It's actually a quadruple exposure. And if you overlap things, it gets messy. Okay. So, you, so this is a trick that shouldn't really be used. Now, go back here and put it back where it's supposed to be. Okay. Now, notice how each time I redo a picture, I tell OpenGL, here's all new parameters to use. Then I redraw the sphere, okay? So I move the sphere, then say, okay, front, front. Okay, I'm only doing the fronts. I'm not, 
I'm not doing the backs because this is a closed sphere. You never see the back of any polygon. The backs of the polygons are inside the sphere. But if you're doing like a wall of a house and you're gonna walk around the house and enter different rooms, you, you know, the wall, you'd have to give it two sides so that when you walked out the door, you would see a different side of the wall. Okay. So uh, that's where people tend to use two-sided real often. Or if, you have to, or if you cut open the sphere. If you took the sphere and only drew half of it, you'd want to give both sides of the polygons an appearance. Otherwise, both sides, uh, actually, I don't know. I don't even remember if by default, if you don't set the back, I don't remember if the back looks like the front or if the, I think the back just is plain. I think the back won't even reflect, maybe won't even reflect light. I don't remember for sure. If you don't set what the backs do. Okay, so we're setting the front and we change the ambient diffuse specular shininess and emission. So, you know, ambient diffuse specular shining emission. That is, you know, we keep changing which, what we're using. Like this was low shininess, this was no shininess. Okay, then this one's going to be high shininess. Okay, now this is actually a pick. If you, this, uh, here's what this one leads up to. If, uh, we just did top row of that picture, and then you could do two more rows. You have to, you know, and there's just a lot of code because every one of these pictures is a big chunk of code. But th there's there's the same sphere drawn 16 times with 16 different, same light, same sphere, but different materials. And um, here's a similar, real famous picture here. This picture at one point was all over the place. It was actually a real famous example of what OpenGL could do. By modern standards, it's stupid. This is nothing. But in the 1980s, this was a pretty big deal. That's a teapot with like, what was it? 24 different appearances of a teapot. They tell you at the top what they are. Like the first row was meant to be jade, obsidian, pearl, Ruby and turquoise. This, no, that's the first, oh, the first column. Yeah, first column is emerald, jade, obsidian, pearl, turquoise. The next column is brass, rock, uh, brass, bronze, and copper. Uh, Did I read that? Brass, bronze, copper. Brass, bronze, Oh, chrome than copper. Yeah, I was reading. Yeah, and brass, and bronze, chrome. First and column, chrome, and gold, ruby, silver. then turquoise. Let's see. For the first column, yeah. emerald, jade, obsidian, pearl, ruby, then turquoise. Because I'm looking at. Oh, the that's out the bottom. And I'm like, that is not. Yeah, yes, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's the that's the ruby. The turquoise just doesn't fit on the screen. Okay, so the, yeah, yeah, none of them look like what they claim they are. Yeah, and and this is what state of the art. This was state of the art in the 1990s. Yeah. Which is what? What year did Toy Story come out? Uh, this is kind of you know, Toy Story was it wasn't done on a GPU. Toy Story was done on 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 servers. But Toy Story wasn't much better than this. Yeah, it was. It wasn't a whole yeah, lot. Yeah, and and this was state of the art around night. This is open. This is a first version of OpenGL, which came out in the late eighties, early nineties. So you can you, know, you you can see what. This is what they meant by changing material properties. Those look like to me. You can definitely see the graininess of it too. Oh yeah, the picture's really low resolution. Yeah, it's not a very high resolution picture either. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's not a very fancy picture or not very high resolution, but that was state of the art you know, 40 years ago, okay? And the code was essentially this code here, just lots of, setting these parameters, just setting big blocks of parameters and just changing them. You know, that's all you were doing. You, know, you, 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 you didn't write logic. Whereas nowadays, you would, you, nowadays, you'd get these different pictures by writing shaders. Now you'd write code for every one of these, but you can make them look like a lot better. So now you would write a shader for every, it's, you'd write 24 shaders here, but the shader could do a lot more and end up looking a lot better than these do. In the old way, it was 24 blocks of code like this, where you're just doing, here's all the parameters, then here's more parameters, and here's more parameters. Okay. Now, here's another example from this book. Next example shows how to 
a little bit about moving a light. This is a Taurus, really ugly looking Taurus. I, I, haven't, I have not changed the color. This is just the code right out of the book. You know, I, I didn't try making it look spectral. any, huh? I mean, it's spectral. It's like well, glowing yeah, it makes it look weird. Like it's like a halo glowing. It's, yeah, but whoever wrote this really chose weird so, parameters. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> now what it is, this guy represents the light. And every time you click the mouse, the light moves 10 degrees. So like now the light is moving behind it. See, now the light is behind and shining up like this. So you get the little bit of glow up there. Then the light is gonna go a couple more clicks and see the light is now behind the Taurus shining this way. And we only see a little, see a little bit of light bends around the edge of the Taurus and gives us that uh, diffuse effect. Okay, so this is the diffuse effect of the light, the light shining this way and it's bending a little bit around the, the Taurus. And then you click, click and the light's gonna be above now the light's directly above shining down. Notice that since it's shining down, this part's being, uh, the light's shining down, like this one's real specular. I don't know why the top's not shining because the light's from above shining straight down. I'm not sure what's, this part's kind of specular. I don't know, this one's not as much for some reason. Now the light's towards the front. Okay, now the light's shining that way, okay? Now, what's weird is how you do this. How do you move a light in OpenGL, okay? And we talked about modeling transformations. You, you know, your homework assignment is to move objects. What do you do if you wanna move a light? It turns out pretty much the same thing. The light is just an object. So you move the light just like you would move an object. So you, uh, the current matrix, remember OpenGL is a state, there's, yeah. So that's why you need push and pop. You have a current matrix and that current matrix moves whatever geometry you give to OpenGL. If you give OpenGL a light, your matrix moves the light. Okay, so let's look at what this one, this one looks like. The code is, here's the, now up here is, here's, it's a real simple light. So notice he's not, that's probably why it's ugly because he doesn't give him any parameters. It's mostly this default. So uh, he's not doing much in terms of uh, parameterizing the light. So he's just, it's, he's taking the default values. See, he's just turning on light zero and it's using its default values. That's probably why the light looks real ugly because he didn't parameterize it in any way. He's just using the default values, okay? Now here's where the light gets moved, okay? Now, if you look in the book, it wasn't indented like this. And it was kind of hard to read. I indented it. See, there's a push and a pop. And then here's a push and it's, oh no, I'm sorry. This push and pop balance here. This push and pop balance here, okay? So there's nested pushes and pops going on here, okay? Now, we've got two things to move. We've got a torus and a light, okay? And it's, think of it as like two objects. Oh, and the, uh, the light is represented by a little square. If you go back in that example, the light is actually where that square is. Remember I said that in OpenGL, if you have a flashlight, you have to program it really complicated. You can't just have a flashlight. You have to have two things. You have to have a thing that looks like a flashlight, and then you have to have a light that acts like a flashlight. You have to kind of keep them around together. That's what he's going to do here. So he's got three objects on the screen. He's got the Taurus, the thing, the thing that's acting like I am the light, the flashlight, and then the actual, and then the actual light. There are three geometric objects, but and the light itself you never see. You don't see like obviously when I turn on a flashlight, you see the light coming out of the flashlight. OpenGL doesn't work that way. If I don't put a model to represent the light source, the light just appears out of nowhere. There's the no way to do like a volumetrics kind of thing with a spotlight. No, 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 no. You don't. Well, you have to create a spotlight model. Mm. Yeah, so you create your own little, you create a real fancy little spotlight model and you get the light coming out of it. But uh, the well, light- what, what I mean is, have you ever turned on like a flashlight in like a really foggy or like smoky room you can see the actual physical beam coming out of the light? Oh, but that's a completely different effect. Okay. Yeah, you, you'd, oh, 
Then now, open jaw memory has the fog. So you can kind of, you probably could do that with a little bit of fog. You know, then you could create the idea that there's light, you know, otherwise you'd have to do something like you, you create, what, think here, what creates that effect? Yeah. What creates it? The light, the object. No, no. Okay, I turn on the light and there's this like, I see this beam. What creates the beam? It's a reflector inside of flesh. That's the reflection of the light on the fog. On the, yeah, all the little particles of fog bounce light around. So how would you mimic that? Put a whole bunch of little particles. Yes. Oh, point clouds. Oh. They're called point clouds. Yeah, which is what the fog, yeah. You'd have to create a little cloud of like a thousand points, each one reflecting a little bit of light. And then you could create your beam. Yeah, and yeah, and yeah, it's, it's a, um, you do it with a point cloud. Let's see, what's the other word people use? Point clouds or, and, and, that's, and that gets you this volumetric kind of thing. Like there's a torus drawn as a point cloud. But here, what you'd want would be the point cloud where actually maybe the points are invisible, except for the fact that they bounce light in a little yeah. bit. Yeah. So, yeah. And then you would just have like a rant, instead of having a point cloud that's in the shape of a torus, you would just create, like maybe you'd fill the beam of the flashlight yeah. with points. Yeah, like the cone or whatever. Yeah. That. So you'd have to compute the cone of the flashlight. Fill the cone with lots of little points, and then and make each one of those little points bounce a little bit of light around. Okay, and then you'd have this cool effect of somebody shining a beam. But OpenGL will not give you that beam like you see in movies, where yeah. a guy turns on a big bright flashlight and there's a beam. Yeah, that OpenGL doesn't do it automatically. A lot of people just put like a, a semi-transparent cone in front of. The yes, flashlight. that's another thing. Yeah, you yeah. could you could just create a surface. That just kind of so you you think of it the you just really want to see the outside of that beam. You don't really care about the inside. So you could create like a like a paper, like a real thin paper. Or you imagine like a real thin paper cone that just kind of glows a little bit, and that creates the sense of a beam. And there's like in a game engine, they probably give you a library call that does that. See, that's the whole point of using game engines. Like that's something that probably a lot of people want. So the game engine would write it for you, a yeah. beam of light. Whereas OpenGL doesn't know squat about it, but somebody could implement it in a library. So OpenGL has the old OpenGL has the fog effect built into it, but it's not very, like you can't do a beam. The fog effect's pretty limited. New OpenGL doesn't do any of that stuff, but it gives you shaders so you could write everything yourself. So in new OpenGL, you just, you write everything, it, it, New OpenGL doesn't do much of anything. You write everything as shaders. Okay, so we've got three things. The torus, the thing that's acting like the light ball, and the light itself. Okay. Then we look at the code. We clear the screen. Now, this, this, pop, this push matrix pop matrix don't really need to be there. He could have just replaced them with a GL identity, okay? And for some, th this is actually a more common way to do it, but uh, by doing a push matrix, he's saying, I'm gonna keep whatever the matrix currently is. Now, in this simple program, the current matrix is the identity matrix. So he could have just, like, he could have gotten rid of this push matrix and this pop matrix and just made this one GL load identity. And then, um, you know, then at the beginning, at the, the next time around, you start off with the identity matrix. Now here, it pushes, but when we start, we get the identity matrix. So here he's saving the identity matrix, then he's restoring the identity matrix here. So it's the same thing as if he just did GL load identity here. Okay, so then translate, okay. Notice that then he does a push, okay. Save the matrix. Do a rotation, then do the light. This rotation affects the light. Okay. This rotation affects the light because then you pop. Just all this is just lighting stuff. Okay. Well, actually, no. This rotation affects the light and the cube. See, the cube is acting as if the light. So this rotation moves where the light is. Then. Um, Oh, 
Oh, there's another translation. What's that translation? The spin is the rotation of the light. So this, you're gonna take our space and rotate it like this. Okay, so it's gonna take our space and rotate it. Oh, I know, you. the light's at the origin. So what you're gonna do is, here's the origin. The light's at the origin. Everything starts out at the origin. Rotate space, then move the light away from the origin. Because that's because it wants to shine back on the origin. So. Start with this, rotate it. That's this. Ah, but then he turns on the light. So that he's all, oh, I, I remember the light, the light just shines in that direction. So the light doesn't really need to be anywhere. When I do this, the, the light isn't really over here or over here. The light's just shining in this direction. So he rotates and then turns on the light, but the rotation has changed the fact that the light's shining in this way. The light itself doesn't have so much a location. You know, it's got a direction. But then he wants the little blue thing to be where he thinks the light is. So then he does to do a translation. Then, then he turns off the lighting. I'm not sure why he turns it off. Oh, I know why. Because the blue thing isn't supposed to be lighted. The blue thing is just blue. So he turns off the lighting, sets the color to, well, a bluish. This is our, so he says, so he's turning off lighting and switching to color mode. Okay, so turn off lighting, switch to color mode. So that makes the little cube just colored, not lighted. So if we go back to this thing, See, see how he looks different? He's, you know, he's a blue green. He's not lighted, he's just colored, okay? So the, this guy's lighted, this guy's not. That's why he looks, that's why he stands out so much. He's not, there's no light on him, okay? So he, he disables the lighting so he can switch to the more simple pure color mode like we were doing earlier in the course where we just, we gave vertices colors and then they just appeared at whatever color you gave them. So the vertices and the torus are going to be lighted. Okay, now, so he turns off the lighting, draws the sphere, then turns lighting back on because now the lighting is going to affect the torus. Okay, so rotate space. Now, rotating space changes the direction that the light's coming from. So then you turn on the light. Okay. Well, that positions the light. So the light is positioned like this, but then you turn it off. The light's still there, but it's turned off. Then you do the translation to move the little guy down here so you can look like it looks like he's shining up there. You turn the, you, you show the little square in color, show it, turn on lighting, pop the matrix. Now popping the matrix, the light's still down here, but now you go back to like this. Okay. Now you're back to the geometry is like this. The light's still down here, but you're like this. And now, because you've moved the light. The matrix, when the matrix was in place, the light was moved by the matrix. So the light's down here, but now you do a pop, you're back like here. So now you draw the torus. The torus is just drawn centered at the origin. If I didn't do this pop, the torus would be rotating with the light. Then the torus and the light would rotate together. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna modify this. I'm gonna make the torus rotate this direction to show you that, that you could then rotate the torus. And I'm gonna, in the next example, I'll make the torus rotate this way while the light's rotating this way, okay? So, so, yeah. You don't have a special, you don't have special matrices for lights. You move lights just like you move any other geometric object. You, you, know, you think of the light as a thing that's sitting in space. It's invisible. The light itself is invisible. Okay, except that it has the effect of it shines on other things. You, you, you do a transformation, then you say, here's my light. That positions the light. Okay? If you pop the matrix, the light stays where you put it, but the coordinate system goes back to what it is when you pop it. So when you do the uh, pop, the coordinate system goes back to here. 
So then when I do the solid transformation, the cor the, the quarter systems, this right, the, re the original one, the, the torus is drawn just like this, okay? And then this pop matrix to here didn't really do anything, okay? Now, here's the next version of that. It's gonna do one little different thing. This isn't in the book. I just thought this would be useful to do. Mm -hmm. No, when transmission is happening, so it's, uh, it's moving both the light and the source together. Yeah, or? well, well kind of, the light's weird. The, when it says that that light is at the little blue box, it's really not at the little blue box. The light just shines in this direction. So the light we say is at infinity. The light's at infinity shining this way, okay? But the blue box is supposed to give you a sense, you're supposed to think, oh, the blue box is right over here. A flashlight is different. A flashlight actually sits at a certain point. He's not using a spotlight here. He's using the default light. The default lights are at infinity. They're like the sun. Yeah, they actually act like the sun. Now think about the sun. The sun beams come straight in. Now the sun moves, comes from different directions, but the rays all come straight. The, the sun does not have a beam of light like a, a, a spotlight does. So OpenGL has spotlights that have a beam of light. Then they have the sun. You, what you imagine is a light bulb infinitely far away that's radiating in all directions. But that means that the light, here's how it's usually drawn as a picture. A spotlight looks like this and the light is coming out of it like that. The rays aren't parallel to each other. The sun looks like this. The sun is rays of light coming in like this. All the light from the sun comes parallel to each other. Now you can change where the sun is. The sun can rise and set, but the sunlight comes in, every line comes in parallel to each other. Now, as opposed to this thing where the lines are coming in at angles. This one, you can set a limit. So like the light can either, like, you know, the light comes between these two angles. This has no limit. The light, all of space, is filled by light beams coming in parallel like that. Okay? So the only thing that matters is what angle is in that. It's out at infinity, but I care about what angle it's at. That's why this guy, this rotation sets the, essentially it's, it's letting the sun rise and set. You know, when we, rock, when we yeah, uh, what you're kind of really doing is there's not a light right there, but there's a light out at infinity that's rising and rotating around this guy, but out at infinity. So all the light beams are coming in parallel to each other. Okay. So like right now, the light is the light's infinitely far away, but behind the object. And all the light beams are the light beams aren't coming out like this. The light beams are coming straight at us. Infinitely far away, light beams coming straight at us. Then about here, the light beam, the, the, the sun is up in the yeah, sun is full height, shining straight down. The light's shining straight down. And all the it's not a spotlight. If there was a spotlight up there, it'd be shining a cone of light down, but it's not a spotlight, it's a sun shining straight down. Okay. So so we only, we, with a light, with a, not a spotlight, but with a light bulb light, the default light, we just care about where its angle is. Now that's why he does a kind of a funny thing here. He sets the angle then sets the light because the only thing that really matters is how high is the light rose from the horizon. But then the little blue box, he needs to say, well, but the blue box needs to move away from the origin. Otherwise it would just be spinning at the origin. So then he makes the little blue, after he's disabled the lighting, he makes the little blue box translate about one and a half units away from the origin. Basically he wants it to be far enough away from the origin that you'll, it'll go across the top. Like, like, make that 0 0.5. 
He's not gonna. He's not gonna clear the top of the torus now. He's probably gonna cut right through the torus. He's he's gonna rotate around like this, just with with the light. But he's not gonna. He's not gonna manage to go up above the torus. So we'll see what that looks like. Oh, okay. Actually, let me do it back in this one. You can't tell where he is yet. See, he's staying inside. See how he's staying inside. I got actually that turns out to be that, that this is exactly radius a half right here. So he's rotating inside that hole, the donut hole, representing the light, but that doesn't make sense. Yeah, you know, we think because we think the light's actually infinitely far away. But you know, here you can see that the, the light now is actually. Down here, but this guy's showing up as only here because we didn't translate him enough to go down here. So the light by default infinitely far away. You only care about its angle. But to make this guy look like he's representing the light, we need to make him at least go below down here. And if I didn't make him go far enough, and if I, if I, I, I luckily I got right at the, this, if, if I did it like here, probably right now he'd be inside that guy. We wouldn't see him. It would probably be inside there. Okay. He'd be inside, he'd be covered by, so you would see him emerge from inside there and then go around and then he would go inside the torus and then go come back through. So real quick, you could probably make it do that by setting the uh, parameter to be 1.0. Let's try 1.0. Hmm? Changing the whole Oh, you're right, I changed the wrong one. So here, I want this to be 1.0. There, he's inside, he's inside, and then he comes out. Now he's inside. See, there he's emerging. See, he's just starting to poke through. You know, he's just starting to poke through. So point 0.1 made him almost at the edge. So this was probably like 0.75. 0.75 would have probably put him right in the middle. You can see he's just poking through. There, he's outside. And now he's going to go bury himself inside the torus. Just, yeah, you know, just, so, so he's, you know, to make him act like he's a light, we need to make him look like he's down here. Because right now the light is way above, but yeah, the, but the light is above by default. It's a light at infinity. Okay, we'll put there.